so can you tell us a bit about yourself and what kind of research you do? Sure. So um, I'm a PhD candidate in the School of Political Studies at UOttawa. Um, so I'm nearing the end of my PhD, hopefully this academic year. Um, and I've sort of been on a series of journeys along the way. Um, I've also worked off and on over the last five, six years at Global Affairs Canada doing research um, for the public service. Um, but primarily now my work is finishing my dissertation in a series of other projects. So it's primarily academic. Um, I work on the politics of membership and status um, at the United Nations Security Council. Um, and the way that I do that is through looking at Canada's nine campaigns to the Security Council um, since 1946. Um, so it's a sort of large scale historical project, which is a little bit um, less typical um, in political science. So I sort of span across both history and political science, which took me a little while um, to find, um, but it's been really great. Um, in terms of sort of learning methods that are a little more unconventional in our discipline. Um, so I work primarily in the archive, and then I also do a series of um, oral history interviews, um, primarily with retired diplomats who worked for Canada um, at the UN. Um, in addition to that, I have sort of one or two projects on the go, um, looking at um, Indigenous sovereignties in Canada and sort of framing um, framing sort of land claims, um, et cetera, through an international relations lens, um, and then another one on sort of feminist foreign policy as well. So when you're conducting research or for your different projects, do you always look at them the same way or are you approaching them differently? Yeah, so I think um, really the challenge is always narrowing down, like what is the question I'm trying to answer? Um, and then going from there. Um, so, you know, what are, so what is the question that I'm trying to answer? Um, is number one. And then number two is um, what is out there that can help me answer this question? Um, and then the third thing is sort of, you know, how do I approach what is out there? So it's sort of finding this sort of right method fit um, by really getting a sense of like what you're looking for, what also you don't know, like what are the, um, what are the things that you sort of need to find out first? Um, and so, you know, as I said in my dissertation, I use sort of primarily um, historical archival work um, and interviews. Um, in other work, I do sort of more contemporary like discourse analysis of policy documents and stuff like that. Um, and so it's primarily qualitative um, overall um, and primarily in a sort of non positivist way. Um, in general, I'm not super concerned about variables and cause and effect of, of, of such variables um, and things like that. Um, and that's sort of where I start to climb into historian territory where it's about sort of reconstructing a story of what happened? How did this go? Do you work typically uh, on your own or do you have a team of people or like? So the thing about a dissertation, dissertation is that you're kind of, you're, you're just out in the world figuring it out. I have very little formal training um, in the methods that I use, um, which I think tends to be tends to be something um, that PhD students come across. You know, you you do all your formal methods training and then you find yourself with a question and the things that you want to know aren't the things you necessarily learned how to find. Um, and so what I've done is um, just a lot of reaching out to historians, um, asking a lot of questions, um, sitting in the back of their like conferences and workshops, um, like listening to how they approach things, um, reading their books. Um, and so I've been really lucky to sort of have um, a little bit of mentorship and support from you know other early career researchers um, who are more than happy to answer my questions. Um, in terms of some of the other projects that I'm involved with, they are co-authored. Um, so I have one of them, let me think, one of them is with a friend who's also a PhD student. Um, and then my partner actually just finished his PhD and began a professor job. So there's sort of a little research group of a few of us. Um, so those are a little bit more collaborative. Um, and the fun thing about co-authoring is you get to do the parts you want to do and you don't necessarily have to do the parts that are Mm -hmm. you're less good at or are less interesting. Um, and so it's the same kind of thing where um, everybody 
ha brings different strengths and you can sort of put out, you know, like, okay, if you go into these documents and look for this, like, let's regroup when you've done that. And then we can sort of figure out like what's next, um, you know, get some feedback, give each other feedback, um, you know, who's really good at thinking about maybe the design of the project, who has, you know, the background on these issues, who can sort of like construct the frame of how we're going to approach this. Um, so co-authoring is a lot of fun. Um, and it's also the best way I think to, um, get to know other people working on the same things as you. Cause you can, you know, you can read other people's work, um, and, you know, go back and forth, but to like, really like learn how the sausage is made and do it together, um, is really rewarding. Um, as you sort of advance, um, career wise, whether, um, you're a researcher in the policy world or you're a professor or whatnot. Um, you're more likely to have a little bit more of a team um, set up, whether you are, you know, collaborating with um, other scholars, um, but you may have research assistants. Um, when I worked at Global Affairs, um, we were a whole team of foreign policy research. Um, and so some of us um, worked on um, sort of more contemporary issues, but also like bridging the gap between policy and academia, um, a sort of subgroup um, on my team that I didn't really work on, worked on foresight. Um, so using research to um, draw sort of short, medium and long-term predictions. Um, and then there was also a group of historians. And so their job was to sort of preserve the past um, and help, help researchers who are looking into the past um, achieve those ends. So um, those were sort of really team oriented experiences. Um, and I think it's really just the sort of dissertation or writing a solo book manuscript at some point in your career that are, um, that are the sort of on your own um, experiences. And you said earlier that like, I mean, you're talking about when with co-authoring um, like different people bringing different strengths, do you get a sense of your strengths just through like trial and error? Did you know what you were attracted to most before? Like it's really a sort of figuring it out on the fly, but then also, you know, particularly in academia, there is a lot of sense of like, you know, the types of research or the types of research methods that will get you a job or be more successful. Um, and I think every PhD student um, falls into that trap a little bit in the beginning. And then you're like, you know what, I'm not actually going to be that successful if I don't have a strong internal drive to do this well. Um, and sort of the best thing you can do is like actually figure out what you want and then do it well and hope for the best. Um, and so, you know, navigating some of the sort of like disciplinary norms and the professional norms um, can be a little confusing at times. Um, but definitely like co-authoring is one of those things as well, because as you sort of bring together different people's strengths or interests, um, it allows you to I think do a really good job of answering the question of like, so what, like, why is this important? What is this sort of contribution to knowledge in the discipline mean? Um, and when you're able to sort of pinpoint like, you know, here's this area that someone works in, here's this area that I work in. Um, if we're bringing it together and maybe asking a new or novel question, um, it gets a little bit easier to sort of position your work, I think, um, and figure out like, what am I adding to the sort of buffet of knowledge out here? It kind of like, I mean, I guess ties in a bit to the question that I want to ask next, which is mm -hmm. like, what does it mean to be a research to you? And then also like what, what perspectives and values do you bring to the work that you're doing? Yeah, so I think particularly working in a sort of like non-positivist um, tradition and also working on, I think, issues and concepts um, that are, I mean, nothing is value neutral, but sort of very embedded um, both historically and um, in our sort of contemporary times. Um, in, sorry, I'm blanking on the word here. Um, that are sort of very um, politically salient. Um, I think, you know, with my, with my dissertation in particular, um, what I'm sort of getting at in sort of looking at a history of the United Nations Security Council and especially Canada's positioning to such um, 
is a sort of contemporary history of imperialism um, and starting to understand the ways that um, imperialism and colonialism have sort of shaped the um, order of international organizations in the way that Canada has been a part of that in many ways. Um, and sort of Canada's relationship to um, the international as it's constructed in sort of a way of, you know, domination and power um, and sort of built on these structures. And then the way that that translates um, into looking at Canada from different perspectives. So, um, you know, when we talk about Indigenous sovereignties in Canada, if we imagine different um, sovereign nations, under sort of occupation of Canada. That's actually really an international relations question in a lot of ways too. Um, so a lot of the values that sort of surround that um, are very much ones of, you know, thinking towards decolonization, thinking towards a sort of politics of liberation. Um, and so in, in international relations, we sort of call it the critical tradition. Um, and that encompasses a lot of sort of like post and decolonial perspectives, feminist perspectives, and sort of those really tend to um, come up a lot through all of the research processes, um, thinking about the implications of those things throughout, um, but also thinking, you know, when we um, when we talk about, um, to quote sort of the late researcher John Ruggie, like what makes the world hang together? Um, it's, it's these sort of series of complex relations of power and domination as they've played out in imperialism and colonialism um, and sort of being attentive to those and also being, um, I think, normatively, normatively engaged in them too matters, you know, like, I, I, I could take a position that these things are bad. Um, and my research is framed around, you know, historically uncovering that bad. Um, and what does that mean for the way that, you know, we imagine our futures of international relations? Mm -hmm. um, can you think of a time in your research, like work that something didn't go according to plan um, and how you had to adapt or, or troubleshoot? Yeah, so, I mean, I think the answer that anybody will give you now is COVID-19. Um, I'm incredibly lucky in a way that I study Canada. Um, so at the time um, when the pandemic started for the first half of it, I was living in Ottawa. Um, and so I did still have limited access to the archives. You know, there are a lot of people who have field work internationally or want to go do research who have had to really revamp their entire projects. Um, for me, it was much more sort of logistical. So I had limited time in the archives because they were only letting in, you know, 10% of people. Um, and so you've got fewer days and fewer time. Um, so it'll be things like, you know, if I order a whole bunch of documents, I could spend days looking at them. Um, but with sort of limited time and access, I took four and a half thousand photos in one day. I did not read a single document. I just made sure that I had images of everything in the boxes. And then it has been months of going through it digitally uh, myself. Um, and then similarly with interviews, I probably would have done a number of them in person in Ottawa and I moved them all to Zoom or phone, which um, is okay anyways, because I think um, a number of dealing with, particularly with retired diplomats, um, you know, I wouldn't necessarily have, have wanted to meet them in person, right? Like necessarily. Um, some of them are like in their 80s and 90s and a phone call is a much more considerate way to reach them anyways um, than, you know, like making them come to campus and sit in my office or something like that. Um, so the transition to sort of Zoom and phone interviews was also um, pretty seamless. You know, for some people, you know, interviewing depends on who the sort of subject is and who the researcher is and sort of I situate myself in that like that sort of social and human relationship matters to the information you're getting. Um, and so I think for some people it was a lot more difficult. Um, but for me, um, I found that there wasn't really a huge difference um, between in person and zoom interviews because um, a lot of these people are sort of, you know, even if they're much older and whatnot they've worked internationally they were public servants for decades like they know um the sort of norms of doing these sorts of things 
over the phone anyways, um, because that's how it was for most of their careers. Um, so I was really lucky that that was not a, a huge barrier for me. Um, one of the things that I always find um, kind of difficult and more difficult um, currently is just the sort of spotty digitization of archival material um, in that like most of it, you still have to go in person um, but then sort of like through networks of people doing it, um, people are sort of like self digitizing. Um, so there's a project at the University of Toronto, um, trying to digitize a lot of the stuff that's in Library and Archives Canada, um, as well as some of the departmental libraries like Global Affairs has its own um, library and archives um, of particular collections um, in particular history of, of the department. Um, but so this project at the University of Toronto is essentially trying to like crowdsource all of the research that people working on these issues have done. And if you've done your own scans and photos, um, they're trying to build a database that increases the digitization that the government doesn't have the capacity to do. Um, so through, you know, reaching out to some of those people and sort of collaborating, um, I can use a little bit of, you know, what other people have done before and still have their records of, um, and I'm hoping, you know, I don't, you know, this is still my first time really doing this. So I don't necessarily have the best, um, digital system myself, but I hope that I'm able to contribute, you know, my now 5,000 and something photos, um, there was one researcher that I um, has been really helpful to me because he's worked on sort of some of the same stuff, but um, he his book was published in 2019 and so he had a few years of work, um, but it's sitting on a hard drive in an office at U of T um, and while the university was closed, he wasn't able to get that hard drive and mail it to me, which really would have like made a huge difference, but it's the kind of, you know, like, it's fine, I figured it out, but it's the kind of barrier that like a lot of people are seeing that like some of the sort of little logistical things are um, are difficult. Um, he did actually, the same um, researcher, his mother found a box of documents from his dissertation 20 years ago in her basement um, and mailed it to me because he was like, I wrote this book, like it's long published, it's long gone my mom's going to get rid of this unless you want it. Um, and similarly, like some of the like retired diplomats are like, well, you know, I still have all these records in my basement. Like, what if I just mailed them to you? Um, and so there's a sort of interesting interplay between like getting to know people through interviews and then the stuff that they give you that doesn't exist in sort of an official channel. In terms of all the interviews that you do, do you have a method of, I mean, you're interviewing important people like um, hmm. you have gaining trust and like is there a way that you think about that as you're going about yeah so I think um for me sort of the like gaining trust and sort of you know getting people to not take me seriously but like understand that I sort of have an institutional background you know having worked in the department myself um for a number of years um sort of gives a sense of like, oh, she knows what she's talking about. Like she's gonna be able to, you know, speak the language, um, you know, ask good questions. This isn't gonna be a waste of my time. And it's also given me like a sort of good like bullshit detector because like, I know how people talk um, in sort of like whether diplomatic circles or just like public service stuff. Like, you know, because I'm able to sort of like speak the language and understand sort of the norms. It helps me like ask better questions and also say like, you know, is that really what happened though? Like kind of like the sort of bullshit detector there. Um, and it's also made it easier, um, you know, to know what I'm looking for in documents and know sort of like, what are um, the more official documents? What do, what's the difference between those and the handwritten memos that like got stuck in between? Um, and there's been a sort of interesting, back and forth between um, documents and people in some cases. So looking at particularly the 70s and the 80s um, when Canada ran for seats on the Security Council, some of those people are still alive, um, but they're also old enough or the documents are old enough um, that they've been declassified to library and archives. Um, so for those cases in particular, um, I'm able to actually say like, hey, 
here's a PDF, like you wrote this in 1987. Um, like here are my sort of specific questions or like, did what was written here actually happen? Like what were the dynamics of that? And it gives me a sense too of like, when you get a huge box of documents, it's hard to tell what was particularly salient or important because the number of pages or documents on it doesn't necessarily mean that. Um, you know, you could have a lot of back and forth, but it could just be sort of bureaucratic necessity. Um, it doesn't mean that that was sort of the most pressing issue on people's minds. It just means that there's a lot of record of it. Um, so going back and forth between people and documents has been um, really good and really interesting. Um, and I guess in some ways it's sort of like, you know, to use the like real methods word is that it's triangulation too. Um, it's looking at what I find in one place and what I find in another place and trying to sort of verify claims and ideas and things like that.